Welcome everybody and good evening. Thank you for, for being here. My name is Dr. Mitchell Green. I'm the owner of Green Psych Clinical and Sports Psychology. I have a private practice in Haverford, Pennsylvania, right in the suburbs of Philadelphia. And I'm coming to you live tonight from my friends, the Gonzalez's dining room, which was not part of the plan. I've had quite a day. Maybe some of you have had it as well. Um, I was doing a webinar midday today, and then the power went out in the middle of my present presentation, and then the Wi-Fi, and then there was an electrical fire in the basement, and then we had to evacuate the building. I ran home to find out the power was out there, the Wi-Fi was out there. So if you think you've had some mind chatter, I've had plenty of it today. So I'm coming to you very prepared to discuss this topic more than I ever planned on being. And I should add as a caveat, given the weather, there's more storms potentially coming. So who knows what's to happen? We have to adapt and adjust tonight, just like you have to do in triathlon. I wanna start off first by acknowledging Christy and Rachel and of course, Steve Delmani of Delmo Sports for helping me organize and set up tonight's webinar. Um, I also wanna to mention tonight as a webinar versus a meeting, this is sort of a listen and learn event. Uh, you won't be able to voice questions to me, um, but I have my psychology intern named Dan Cohn, who you can't see, but he's gonna be managing the chat box. So Dan is gonna be there fielding questions, answering the ones that he can answer and getting the questions over to me that he thinks will be helpful to the presentation and to moving things along for us tonight. So feel free to shoot a message and know that Dan's gonna be checking them out and passing them on to me. Dan also just got engaged only a week ago to a beautiful woman and he is uh, happy to get your congratulations or best advice as well wonderful woman named Emma. So you might be thinking, um, I certainly have been thinking that maybe uh, this isn't the right time to be doing a webinar on open water swimming. When I first had that thought that maybe this isn't the time to be doing it, it was no one was swimming, we don't have pools open, there's no set dates for any races coming up in the near future. So I thought maybe this isn't, you know, maybe this isn't the right time. But after the events of the last few weeks, like you, I'm very sensitive to the fact that presenting on this topic might seem trivial in the face of what our country is facing racially, politically, and morally. But as you can see, I decided I wanted to press on, as obviously you do as well, because you're here with me. And because like, like me, just like you, our sport goals are important to us. More important than our, our own personal goals, it's our community, right? It's our community that is so important to us. And together, I hope through conversation and connection, whether it's virtually or when we get together, we can help each other heal. My wish is also that tonight, while I'm putting out some information to help you and help you grow, and pursue your own dreams, that you too uh, use this as a springboard to work to try to help other people achieve their goals. So our hearts may be heavy tonight, but today, tonight we are optimistic and we're future focused. So many of you, I imagine, uh, may recognize me from being on the ferry boat at Escape the Cape Triathlon. I'm proud to say I've known Steve Del Monte, uh, ever since the beginning of, the, of the, his Escape the Cape races. And I've been on the boat every single year from 2013 on. And I've watched literally thousands of nervous and panicky jumpers and swimmers jump and swim to great success. And as many of you can attest, who've completed either Escape the Cape or some other triathlon event or even some other race, you know you really haven't been the same since you've done that race in all the best kind of ways. And that's why you keep coming back. It's not just that you feel different, it's that you are different. You become somebody different 
when you participate in something that really tests your mettle and pushes you way out of your comfort zone. You wind up getting closer and closer to becoming the person that you aspire to be. And that's why we're here. And that's why even open water swimming, which is, can be such, a, such an enormous hurdle and obstacle for people, that's why you're back and you want more because you haven't, you're not done discovering what you're capable of. That's the good news. You haven't yet discovered what you're capable of. I'm excited to try to help you experience that. Beyond my work with Delmo Sports, just to further introduce myself for those who don't know, I'm a contributing columnist for USA Triathlon. I write for Triathlon Magazine. And I'm the sports psychologist to several professional and Olympic triathletes and other athletes, including your hometown man, Joe Malloy, a new father. Uh, congratulate him if you get a chance to connect with him. And I myself race triathlon, as has my wife, both of us completing Ironman. So I feel like I'm coming to you today from every angle, from someone who sits uh, across from somebody in my office and has private conversations, to being on the boat, to writing on the subjects, to helping those who we watch on TV. So that's my introduction here. I want to jump in here and begin to lay some foundations because tonight is really me doing some teaching, really beginning to kind of teach you about, about the mental game. And uh, I apologize if this is uh, going to move a little slow for you and ask you to pay more attention at 7 o'clock at night than you wanted to. But let me just build a little mindset foundation for you first. And then before you know it, we'll be getting into the meat and potatoes. Here's one of the most important points, though, that I want you to get from the beginning, which is that most of the day, every day, you and I are at work, or for some of you are in, still in school, or some of you do some combination of that. And at work and school, you show up, you try to complete the task you need to, you ask your boss, or if you're the boss, you ask your, your boss, or you get your employees to give you feedback, or you give them feedback, you work on the project, whatever that project might be that you're working on and you send out that final product. And I understand that comes sometimes with a lot of issues, a lot of ups and downs, but you understand how that works. And um, generally people feel some sense of control over that process and over the outcome. I understand you don't have total control over the outcome, whether someone's gonna be happy with your final product, but there's some sense of control. And I want to I want to make a differentiation between our day to day lives and what's required mindset wise in the world of triathlon. Triathlon, if we just do this by ways of comparison, you can see if you look across, you show up, you train, 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 you talk with your coach, you work on your technique, and then you go out there and race. But here's the difference, guys: in triathlon and in sport, the outcome is so much more uncertain. In other words, you have so much less control over the final product than you do most likely in any other part of your life. If you're working at work and you need to get that job done, you might stay up all night to get it done. But in triathlon, you get that one shot. In that race, you get the one shot. You can't just go back and fix it right away. And because of that, that amount of uncertainty um, the point I want to make here is that triathlon requires its own particular mindset. And if you've been using the same mindset that you kind of used in your day-to-day -day life, in your triathlon life, triathlon life, you're probably not as ready as you should be to tackle the race and the challenges that come with sport. I hope that makes some sense to you. The argument here is that we're looking for a particular mindset, and that's what tonight's uh, talk is going to be about. So the kind of mindset appreciates that your open water swim is quite different than anything else most likely that you're doing in most of the rest of your life. And the fact that you have less control over exactly how your swim is going to go means that you're going to have increased chatter. I know we haven't defined chatter yet. We will. And appreciating this lack of control Appreciating the fact that there's so much more uncertainty um, is going to be an advantage for you, not a fear factor for you, I hope, but something that turns out to be an advantage for you 
as long as you know how to manage the fear and the doubt and the uncertainty. I might say this several times over the course of the talk here, but you can't directly control how fast or how well you swim in your open water swims. You can't directly control how well you swim or how fast you swim in your open water swim. If you could directly control it, you would swim as fast and as well as you always want to. But I know that sounds silly, doesn't it? Nobody does that. Um, but because you cannot control it, we must find other things that we could focus on. And what often happens in racing is we try to control the things that we can't control. That gets us into some hot water and that generates all kinds of chatter. So let me continue to move forward as I begin to lay the groundwork for the kind of plan that you need. And that's around this subject of mind chatter. So now let me define what I mean by mind chatter. So for me, mind chatter is defined as that conversation that we have with ourselves that's full of doubt, second guessing, and negativity. Now here's what's important initially to understand about chatter, is uh, if you're watching a Netflix movie tonight with your family, probably or hopefully not a lot of mind chatter, not a lot of doubt, not a lot of second guessing, not a lot of negativity. Um, if you're going for a nice walk with your dog around the block on a beautiful evening, I'm hoping as well, not a lot of doubt, not a lot of second guessing, and not a lot of negativity. Because, and the point here is that mind chatter shows up under very specific conditions. And the more you understand and appreciate the conditions under which mind chatter shows up, the more control, uh, sense of control you'll have over it. And I'll explain. Um, Oh, so I gave you the examples of when mind chatter may not show up, for example, going for a walk or watching Netflix. But if I told you that there was an open water swim tonight or tomorrow morning, your mind chatter would begin to pump out messages of doubt and second guessing and negativity. Kind of like the way my mind chatter today when I found out my Wi-Fi was out of my office, my Wi-Fi was out at home, started to pump out messages of, I don't think this is going to go well. What if I'm running too crazy and I don't have time to settle before I give the talk? What if I'm feeling too rushed? What if I don't get a chance to do my PowerPoint? What if this all comes off the wrong way? Maybe I should just stop. Maybe I should reschedule. My chatter had all kinds of conversations with me that showed up. And why did it show up? It showed up because the two conditions that you need for mind chatter were present. One, there was uncertainty. So if I just use myself as an example, I didn't know where I was going to find Wi-Fi included the fact that it's COVID. I wasn't sure what house I could wind up in that I could feel safe in and the people would feel safe having me here. Another level of uncertainty beyond something we ever really have ever dealt with. And the other condition that you need for mind chatter to show up is there has to be something at stake. And so because this matters to me and communicating with, with you all matters to me, um, uh, my mind chatter started to show up. There are other things that I had planned to do tonight, um, even rescheduling some things that, or you know, a conversation I was going to have with somebody. There's not too much at stake because it wasn't like 100 people signed up for a webinar the way you all did tonight and made time out of your busy schedule in the evening. So for me, because there was uncertainty and something at stake, the conditions were there for chat. Same for you in an open water swim or triathlon, and even in general, perhaps where you don't know how the swim's gonna go. Of course, nobody does. And for you, there's all kinds of things that can get stirred up for what's at stake, which we're gonna talk about in a second. And the more you can appreciate, ladies and gentlemen, what's at stake and understand how the mind begins to focus on these things, you're gonna see that's gonna actually begin to free you up. I'll get to that in a second. But just maybe by way of another example, if I handed you a beaker, let's say like a lab beaker full of water, and it was filled to the top, and I asked you to walk across your, your living room, um, while you might not be sure whether you'd be able to keep the water in, there's really not much at stake, because if you spill droplets of water from this beaker, nobody cares too much, no damage is going to be done, right? But if I put some sort of acid, some to toxic acid in there, and then fill it to the rim and, and ask you to walk across, all of a sudden, your mind will start pumping out messages of, 
what if I drop it? What if it tips a little bit? What if I burn myself? What if it gets on the rug? What if the dog starts to kind of walk underneath me and she gets hurt? In other words, when we sense that there's things at stake, I realize I'm driving this point home, um, that's when the mind will begin to chat. And by the way, in the example, the sort of silly example I realize of, of walking across your room with acid, um, I want you to appreciate that under those conditions, thank goodness you have mind chatter, right? I want you to appreciate that mind chatter isn't a bad thing. There's nothing wrong with having mind chatter. Thank goodness you have chatter. If you just walked across your living room willy-nilly and all of a sudden the acid went everywhere, well, you could imagine what would happen. Everybody would get hurt. So thankfully, you have a mind that sort of says, well, what if, what if, and what if, and helps you conservatively take your time as you walk across the room. The problem, as we'll come to see in triathlon and open water swimming, is that your chatter does you basically no service. It works against you, not for you, but I want to make sure you appreciate, though, that it's normal to have. It's not a sign of being a coward. It's not a sign that there's something wrong with you. It's not a sign of being ill-prepared, although there are people who do show up to races ill-prepared. But if you've done the work and you're prepared and you still have doubts about preparation, that's the normal part of it. If you think, I, I wish I had one more extra swim before I did this race, that's pretty normal. I am gonna just also put out a quick mention that I'm getting a tornado alert on my phone. I'm also going to acknowledge that we have a surprise guest here all the way from Wildwood, New Jersey. Uh, some of you might recognize him, um, Steve Delmonte. Steve, you want to say hello? Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for uh, joining in, Steve. Um, and um, we are moving along here, Steve, beginning to get into the meat and potatoes of the talk, beginning to talk about how mind chatter, and I know this is something that you uh, have been very vocal about, how having chatter, having doubt, second guessing and negativity is not a sign that there's something wrong with you, not a sign that you're a coward, a wimp, a loser. Um, I want you to know as somebody who talks to athletes at every level of sport, including triathlon, as I've mentioned, that everyone has some degree of chatter. I was in Rio, at the Olympics. Imagine having something at stake, like having the words USA across your chest and, and um, spending the last four years, if not your whole life, going for the gusto for one race, one moment in time. Of course, those athletes had chatter. And the difference, the difference that they made when they performed well was because they were prepared for the chatter. They didn't make it as something that they were doing wrong. So let's jump in a little bit more to this idea of what's at stake. I want you to appreciate, because I think you'll have some appreciation, um, that it could be the kinds of things we worry about is everything from the sharks that might be somewhere out there to getting bumped, particularly as you go around a buoy or somewhere else, someone touching your feet, how dark the water is, whether there's seaweed, whether there's jellyfish, um, just the fact that it's an unknown our minds begin to chat and worry about all the potential consequences of the sorts of things that you see on the screen. But as a psychologist, of course, I wanna dig a little bit deeper and I want you to dig a little bit deeper as well, because really I want you to appreciate that there's another level of fear that goes on that I actually think is scarier than some of the things you see on the screen right now for many of us. And that has to do with this idea of what's at stake having to do more with this sense that our egos will be completely damaged if we don't finish, the fear of not meeting expectations, the fear of disappointing ourselves or perhaps others. For some of us, the chatter gets going around this sense of embarrassment or someone finishing ahead of you who, quote unquote, shouldn't be finishing ahead of you in your mind. Comparing yourself to last year's performance, thinking, there's no way I can't do better, I've trained harder. Looking bad in front of your coach, the fear of underperforming, having wasted your money, the list could go on and on, but I want you to appreciate when the mind gets going and it starts to deliver the messages that interfere with our performance, 
it's at the level of yes, things that interrupt that have to do with swimming, but it also has to do with the things that are deeper than that. And but when you start worrying about those things connected to swimming, and then we get to the other level of thinking that this is somehow a reflection of who you are and your worth and your value, and you don't know how to manage that, that's when stuff goes downhill for you. That's when an ordinary swim that you're ready for turns into a disaster. That's when panic could set in. And I'm excited tonight, guys, because I know, I know this experience. I know how you might see it coming. And we need to begin to get on top of it. And you can get on top of it because I want you to appreciate that this is how the mind works. This is how the mind works with my silly example with sulfuric acid walking across a living room. Um, I want where I told you that the mind will look for trouble. This is what the mind will do in racing. It's there to protect you. It's like a scripted piece that the alarm goes off the morning of your race. You think, why the hell did I do this? I can't believe I got to get in water right now. And the more you could appreciate that this is, this is normal and scripted and part of the competition experience, the less you'll, when the chatter comes in, you'll think that you have to react to it and overcompensate for it. So we're going to talk more about ways to handle that. And I hope that's, that's hitting home for you guys and making sense. I'm going to, I, the way I present, you're going to find me circling back and circling back. So it's going to make sense by the time we're done for sure. So let's talk about you and your mind chatter. Um, so there you are trying to focus on your swim graphics, by the way, courtesy of my college age daughter. I couldn't tell you how she did put this all together, but graphics courtesy of her. There you are, and then the chatter starts to show up. I realize it shows up oftentimes before you're actually in the water. And your chatter has a very common theme, as we've talked about. It starts to think about, think about those things that, um, that put you in danger or put you at risk. But again, of course the chatter is doing those sorts of things because it's looking out for your well-being. And the more you can appreciate that this is sort of what chatter is trying to do, the better you can handle it. Here's the visual if you could look at the screen for a minute in my hand. So you show up to the race and so does your chatter. From my point of view as a sports psychologist, you never show up to a race alone. You show up and so does your chatter. And while you are showed up to a Delmo race because you're looking to experience something that you haven't experienced before, you're looking to challenge yourself in a way that you can't get sitting behind your desk or feeding your family every night while you're aspiring to reach certain goals. I'm trying to get you to appreciate your chatter has a wholly different agenda than you do. It is not interested in that stuff that you're interested in. It is only interested in protecting you. The problem is it's on overdrive. The problem is it's exaggerating and embellishes um, every little sort of small thing that might show up as a, as a worry for you. So what winds up happening, if you will, is that chatter sits on top of you and, and sort of has the power. And now it's not really you swimming in the open water, it's you doing a couple of strokes, but your chatter deciding how things are gonna go. What the goal of tonight is to get you to feel like you are more on top of it versus it on top of you. And I get it, we haven't talked about how to do that yet, but I'm trying to give you a sense that this is sort of the plan that we're putting in place. If you have the mindset that there's something wrong because you're having those doubts, and then you have doubts about the fact that you're having doubts, I'm calling that the double whammy. When you have mind chatter about the fact that you're having mind chatter, now you're in trouble. Because, and that happens all the time, I'm saying it and Steve's giggling because he knows, that is so common. You think, you know what? I trained my butt off for this one. I was in the open water tons of times for this race. I'm not supposed to be feeling this way. And immediately you're making yourself wrong for having thoughts that are completely legitimate. So you think, oh, I'm not supposed to feel this way. I promised myself I wasn't going to feel this way. I'm supposed to be feel more confident. And before you know it, you're losing. 
and you've lost before you've ever dove in. So you're with me. I think you're probably with me. What are you supposed to do? Let's get to it. How are we going to let the chatter be? How are we going to acknowledge that the chatter is there because you can't ignore it. By the way, those of you who try to ignore it, pretend it's not there, think it's gonna go away. We know that just when you resist it, the more it persists. What you resist will persist and what you let be will let you be. What you resist will persist and what you let be will let you be. So while you're darn nervous, this is not some recipe guys, by the way, to make you like not nervous, not worried. Every race I've done, I've been nervous as heck. I, and I'll describe one in a minute. I know Steve, every race he shows up to, he's got all kinds of butterflies, all kinds of thoughts, all kinds of question marks, just like everybody else, no matter how much Steve is trained and no matter whatever level he's performed at. So the idea is you have these thoughts, but you're not these thoughts. You notice and acknowledge these thoughts and we begin to push them behind us Again, appreciate the graphic. We appreciate now they're instead of being on top of you, you are now beginning to feel like you're getting on top of it. And again, how do you do that? So down at Ironman Cozumel years ago, there I was waiting to dive in. And what showed up before the race? That's right, my mind chatter. And my mind chatter, by the way, began to say first, holy crap, what if you freak out? You're the guy who helps everybody else not freak out. What if you have a freak out? That is so not cool and not good. And then of course it quickly went to, wait, what if you don't finish the swim? And by the way, I'm a fine swimmer. I'm far from the fastest guy and I'm far from the slowest guy. I'm a middle of the packer. There was no reason I shouldn't finish the swim. But of course my mind went to, well, if you don't finish the swim, then you can't get on the bike. You spent thousands of dollars. You brought your whole family down here. And then my mind chatter went to, oh my God, the chip. People back home, I forgot that they could be seeing me. Now, again, I'm, I'm not the fastest guy around, but Lord knows I don't want to be the slowest guy around, right? My chatter was worried about embarrassment, not looking good, uh, disappointing myself and maybe others. I was coached up on this. So what I did, because thankfully I knew a thing or two about chatter, still nervous, is I say, I'll say this in a couple of different ways. I thanked my chatter for sharing. I looked at my watch, I smiled to myself, and I thanked my chatter for sharing. Now, as silly as that might sound, I want you to take a second and think about what is it that I might mean by that? Because it's very powerful. So instead of having those thoughts and going, oh my God, here they are again, I had a wry smile to myself and I acknowledged and I thanked them for sharing. By thank for them for sharing, I immediately began to put myself on top. And what I was doing in my mind was, I'm so clear that while I'm interested in trying to do something that I don't know if I'm going to be able to do as best as I can, my chatter has a totally different agenda, as I've described. It doesn't want me to look bad. And I thank it for sharing. I'm like, I get it. I get it. You don't want me to look bad. You're worried about what could go wrong. You're worried about my embarrassment, which has nothing to do with why I'm doing this race. So every race, a Delmo race that you do, when chatter shows up, it has nothing to do with why you showed up. We talked about that or alluded to that, certainly. You're showing up because you want to be different. You want to be bigger. You want to be better. You want to live. You want, to, you, want to, you want butterflies. You want that. That's why you click register. Your chatter doesn't give a crap about that. It would much rather you stay in bed. It's safer there. So... When I say thanks for sharing, I'm acknowledging to my chatter that while you're interested in the results and what could go wrong, I have something else that I'm busy focusing on. That is very powerful. Other ways, so what I'm trying to do, guys, other ways to speak about this is I'm trying to get you to appreciate that we're changing the relationship that you have to your doubts. That's the most powerful way for you to get on top of them. It's not by training more, although I'm not against you training more, don't get me wrong. It's not about you just having more willpower. It's about changing the relationship you have to your doubts. We're going to talk about confidence in a minute. When someone says to me, Doc, I'm not feeling confident. I need to be more confident. What I hear is that they don't know how to manage their doubts. You don't have to be any more confident. 
by the way, why would you feel confident? Why would you feel confident? That's right. Why would you feel confident, by the way, if you've never jumped off a damn ferry before? I jumped off it the first year. I was far from confident. We'll get back to that. You don't need to be more confident. What you need to get better at, as we're describing, is figuring out how to manage these doubts. So what I'm talking about is I'm making room for it. I'm like, instead of you being like this, I can't have them. We're making you big and big and be bigger than your doubts. By acknowledging them, noticing them, some people like a welcome into the party. Some people say, hey, welcome to the party. Come on for the ride. Um, some people thank them, you know, thank them for sharing, say, all right, what's next? Um, anything, you could curse at them if you want, but I, what I'm not looking for is for a big fight to happen. You've already been busy fighting with your, with your doubts. This is more of an acceptance-based, mindful approach. I know you haven't heard me use mindfulness because that term's overused, but it's an acceptance-based, mindful approach that any thought that comes in that sort of chattery is supposed to be there. That's not the problem. The problem isn't the chatter. The problem is you haven't had the proper relationship to the chatter to free you up. Okay, so listen, ladies and gentlemen, that's all a big piece of step one. I'm not done with you yet, because that's not enough to get to the promised land. But it is the big step, a huge step. And by the way, you might see the applications to this outside of triathlon in social relationships, in family relationships, in your work life, where of course, just like me, as I described to you when I found out today that I had to do my talk from someone else's dining room versus my office, I had chattery thoughts as we discussed about it. Chatter shows up in all kinds of places for me and for you. And I hope you'll find this, this way of relating to this powerful outside of just sport. You know, how you manage COVID, how you manage all kinds of other things where, where you are worried and there are things a lot at stake. So where I want to move to next is also important. So the big goal in any, let's say, open water swim, you jump off the ferry boat and I'll just use Escape the Cape as an example. I know there are other open water swims and other things, but let's just stick to ETC. I understand that the big goal, and you need to have goals. I'm not anti-goal. If I told my Olympians, hey, don't worry about your goals, they tell me to go take a hike, right? So I'm interested in your goals. I'm interested if you want to swim the race in a certain time. I'm interested if you want to finish the open water in a certain time period. I'm not against goals. I'm all for this. But I want you to see that you cannot directly control how fast you will swim you will not be able to directly control how well you swim. As I said earlier, I understand I'm repeating myself. If you could do that, you would always swim as fast and as well as you want. That's not sports. That's Disney World. That's Disney World, where everybody at the end is happily ever after. That's not what we're talking about here. Because you cannot control the outcome, and by the way, my chatter is only interested in outcomes. I could have said this earlier, but I'll say it now. When it's worried about embarrassment, that means, are you gonna get the outcome you want? When it's worried if you're gonna disappoint someone, that means, are you gonna get the outcome you want? If you're not gonna meet expectations, that means you're worried about the outcome. It's all outcome based. So you could have your big goal, but you need to put that in your so-called back pocket, so to speak, and or leave it on the deck of the ferry. And then I want you to make sure that you have, which many people don't, sub goals. These are goals that are, are more in your direct control. And I generally like these sub goals to be focused on areas in the swim where you wanna see yourself improve. Sometimes I'll ask an athlete, if your coach was sitting here or your friend who you swim with was sitting here or you were watching you swim, give me a couple of ideas of where you think you need to get better. And I understand for some of us, it could be a laundry list of 20 things. For others, they immediately can dial into two or three things about their head position or their reach or their kick or their pull or their sighting, et cetera, et cetera. And I want you to just pick like two of those things. I would say, what are the two most important? And again, that's debatable, but I want you to know what those two most important things are. 
And if you don't have those locked in before you jump off the boat, from a sports psychologist point of view, you're not ready to go. If all you want to do is swim well, to me, who doesn't want to swim well? You're not, you're boring me. Someone says, well, I want to have a good swim. Again, I get that. But from my point of view, I'm thinking you're not ready to go. Everyone wants to have a good swim. What will make a swim in the open water special for you is if you could lock in on a couple of these small goals. And generally, the way I try to help people get to them is by focusing on some areas that you want to improve on. So for some of my athletes, it could be the first um, you know, 30 strokes after they land in the water, they want to focus on settling their breath down. They want to focus on their catch. They want to focus on their reach. They want to focus on breaststroke for the first 30. Of course, there's a million possibilities here. They want to find more open water. Um, now, you jump in, the, you jump in, and guess what happens at your next escape the cape? Hopefully, it won't happen if you listen to our instructions. Your goggles fall off. Happens so much. Um, if you are, a second that happens, I not to bring up such a negative, but thankfully that's, that should be the worst of it. Um, immediately your chatter will have something to say about that. Oh my God, now I'm never going to reach my goals. Oh my God, you were supposed to have a good swim. Now you're never going to have a good swim. This is not what I was planning for. Oh my gosh. Now I get it. I have my goggles jumped off of my goggles. I would be thrown for a second too. And what I see with people is they'll right there in that first 10 seconds, their race is over. Sometimes their day is over because they're miserable because they think somehow it's all supposed to go according to a certain plan. As I described tonight, it sure doesn't work that way. But what you could do is once, of course, you get your goggles back set, then you lock in on the small goals. You have to be like a laser beam. As I often will say, I will take a focused athlete over a confident athlete every day of the week. You don't, when you jump off and if your goggles were to come off, who's confident? I wouldn't be confident at that point about how to handle that sort of thing. You know, it takes a second to get your bearings and people are jumping and all that kind of thing. But if you're focused, now we're onto something. And what do I want you to be focused on? Not on everything Chatter was looking forward to, but on these small things where you can lock back in. As I like to say, when the moment feels big, you need to think small. And open water swimming, as we've alluded to, has so many things that feel so, 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 so big and overwhelming. Your job is to shrink it. Chatter is not interested in shrinking it, but if you can manage it by acknowledging it, pushing it back, so to speak, you will begin to feel like you are now more on top of it then you're swimming with it on top of you. You're less just surviving out there. Now you're swimming in the way that you've been swimming in your training. And speaking of training, this is something that you could accommodate to your training. You could be spending time. I understand we're not in the pool yet, but as I said to you, we're here today and because we're future focused and we're optimistic. So you will get in the pool and you will get in the lake and the ocean, et cetera. And you will in terms of race preparation, not just put your mileage in and go, okay, I swam a half mile, I swam a mile, I'm done. You're not done. If you haven't spent time focusing in on the small areas of improvement, and I get it, that's the time to work on it. Even when there's nothing at stake in a training day, even when no one's posting your times, there's no ego threat necessarily. There can be, I understand. But let's say generally speaking, not. If you're not working on your mental game then, that you're not prepared for the race. And as Steve will argue, he wants you to focus on both getting the time in the water, in the pool, in the ocean, on the bike, et cetera. And he and I want you to be preparing your mind mentally, knowing that on race day, you're gonna have to adopt a mindset that's gonna require you to deal with uncertainty and doubt and everything else I've been describing today. So use those small sub goals in training. Play with different ones. There's no right or wrong ones. You could change them up from day to day for all I care. 
So your coach might give you a time to finish the set. And instead of aimlessly wandering your mind too much, focus in on a couple of small things that you want to execute and improve. Because what I'm looking for from you in your training and after you finish the swim at Escape the Cape is I'm interested in you telling me what you learned. Let me drill this point in. It is critical. And I spend the time with my Olympians talking about this and I'm spending time with you talking about it. If you get out of your open water swim and, and I ask you how it went, and I understand at some level you're gonna be like, you know, I survived and I get that, I really do, I do get that. But after that, I really want you to be able to tell me where you got better. And if you come out of it and go, I don't know, I just sort of like kind of just whatever, I don't know. Again, from my sports psychologist thing, psychology chair, I'm frustrated with you. Because I want you to be able to get out of that swim. I want to encourage you, encourage you, suggest to you to have those things. So when you get out of swim, you know what? I really found that I was able to hold this pace and because I, by really executing this catch, but I just got fatigued. Or I realized, you know, the sighting I was trying to improve on, I realized, you know, and I, I kind of not that good at it. I kept my neck kept getting too tired. I have to figure out a better technique. Or how I deal with being bumped. You know what? I feel I learned that, you know what? I kind of responded pretty well initially, but then I got really frustrated. There's a million things that you can learn. And if you're not learning, then you're not getting better. My frustration, and I know that Steve would share this, is then next year's Escape the Cape, just to be dramatic, and then you got into next year's. I want you to be able to use the things you learned in the swim the year before and say, okay, now I know, or in your next triathlon, now I know what I need to be focused on, or I have to work back on in the pool or in my practice open water swims. Can that you see a good point. how I'm drilling down here? Steve, do you want to add something? Yeah, that's a good point. I think uh, the, the main hurdle I see with athletes, and I've seen thousands and thousands of athletes go into open water is um, there's no doubt they are putting the work in the training, but a lot of times it is not done in the situations that they will be competing in. And the best way to overcome any fear, I don't care what fear it is, particularly open water swimming, is you must regularly get in the open water for swim practice, whether it is a lake where you live, whether it is uh, Ocean City Swim Club, whether it's the Wild Harbor Tri Club, wherever you may be, the more you get in the open water, the more experience you have, not with open water, but with the mind chatter. You need to go 15 rounds with your mind chatter. You know what I'm saying, Doc? It's like, and then you start to understand the patterns of your mind chatter when you get into open water because i will tell you i'm 43.2 years old and every time i and i was in the ocean this morning by myself there i hear the jaws theme music okay it's coming i know it's coming all right and i also know it will go away it's just part of that process and the only reason i know that is because i've logged thousands of yards you know, in open water. And so that's how I know how to deal with it. So the experience part is a very deal. Yeah, Steve, Steve said it very well, that just because you have a thought doesn't mean it's going to come true. And it's more you can kind of appreciate that. Anyway. And, almost <laughs> chuckle with it. And, and the more you could chuckle with it, then you're beginning to get on top of it. And Steve said it's really right. Clearly being in open water, there's no, no, no substitute for that for you getting ready for your triathlon season um, and challenging yourself, certainly safely, obviously safely in a safe way. But if you're not getting chatter in some of your swims, then you're not taking advantage of your swims. If you're not experiencing some chatter, then you are not rehearsing for the game day. And that is as Steve alluded to, one of the mistakes that people make. So maybe not just getting into the water, but not setting enough time and challenging yourself. Because one, whether you're, by the way, swim, bike, and run. Um, because one of the best things you can do when you're in the open water swim and you start to have chatter come, you could be like, you know what? This is just like two weeks ago when I heard the Jaws theme and there were no Jaws. And when I was worried about being touched, but I had my buddy bumping me, 
and it kind of was annoying, but nothing bad happened. Immediately, you can reference those hard workouts and bring them in to your game day preparations and your game day confidence, if you will. So I hope you see that we, this subject of learning and where do I want to learn in training? How do I bring it into races? And how do I learn from that race? This is how we get better. When athletes are plateauing, I know it because I'm asking them, so what did you learn from that? Did you change your strategy? Did you do anything different? They go, no, I was just sort of hoping it would work out. You know, and that is partly why they're frustrated. So one of my mantras, and Steve has the wristband to, to prove it, and is that, that it's really less about how confident you are when you're doing something that you haven't done before, especially. And it's really the question for you is, how courageous can you be? Instead of asking yourself for confidence, which I've described is a bit overrated, and confidence, by the way, shows up after you do it. When you get out of that open water swim at Escape the Cape or any of the Delmo races or any race you do, and you're like, yes, you're like, oh, what was the big deal? Okay, now you got a little bit of confidence. I, I'm gonna get out of your way, that's great. But it's hard to have it before. And one of the sayings I like is, courage over confidence, I trademarked it. Because you cannot experience courage except in the presence of fear. Fear by definition precedes courageous action. So if we could begin to look at the doubts and the second guessing and the negativity as opportunities to be courageous, holy cow, we've now turned it completely on its head. Instead of what's wrong with me, I can't believe it, there's something wrong, I'm a coward, I'm such a wimp, she's confident, he's confident. Now we see when we have those doubts that this is an opportunity for us to be courageous because you cannot be courageous except in the presence of fear. The people we right. see marching in the streets, the people we see taking a stand against some of the big political issues of our time, I'm not sure how confident they are. As we all know, there's a lot going on right now and a lot that can be scary. But Lord knows they have great courage to speak their minds, to take a stand, to, to try to make a difference. They're doing that in the presence of not knowing what the result's going to be. And I want them to inspire you as they've inspired me. They seem to be inspiring my kids too, to realize that in order to make a difference, it really is about being courageous. And of course, once you're able to get some things under your belt, your confidence will build. But you don't do these races because you want to be confident. If you were confident about everything, if Steve wanted to be confident, he would uh, wait for 10 people to swim with him in the ocean this morning. He was, you know, confidence, but confidence is easy. It, you grow from being courageous. And these races are opportunities. They, and I don't want you to lose sight of that. That's why you're doing the races. You don't have to do these races. You don't have to go spend hundreds of dollars, get up early, swim in an ocean at seven in the morning, jump off a sick at prairie book. You don't, you don't have to do any of that. You do it because you want to grow. And in order to grow, it requires that kind of courage. And I have flyers, or not more like postcards for you. So you'll email me, and I will, like Steve Delmonte will email you, or not email you, he will mail you uh, your mug and your finisher's mug uh, or, or beer stein that you wanted after last year's race. And I know he spent the effort and energy. I will put in the mail to every one of you, everyone who wants one, you'll email me. This, this courage over confidence will sit by your desk. You'll put it in your race bag. You'll, you'll tattoo it to you. I'll get you a wristband as well as Steve has, any which way that you could remind yourself. And athletes need reminders. Steve Delmani needs a reminder about where his head should be. Everyone needs reminders and you need reminders too about exactly where you wanna keep yourself and where you wanna focus. All right. Doc, you said something in the beginning about Go ahead. Real quick. Yes, yes, About yes. Uh, things that you may, that you may be, the athlete may be scared of, whether it's disappointing a coach or it's not finishing or it's poor performance. And I have checked off every one of those things in my time. And that is something where that you can only, because I guess I've experienced all those quote unquote failures, that allows me to, go forth and take on new challenges. Look, I've been there. I, I didn't get the outcome that I wanted 
or to tell my wife I DNF'd, I couldn't finish the swim at Columbia because my back hurt or whatever it is. Or I put in how many yards and, and I swam slower? How's this possible? Like I've done all those things and those are going to happen. So now what I do is I just break it down. It's like if I, I get up in the morning and I show up at the race. I smile. I look at the gods. I'm, I'm thankful. I'm like, that's what I'm going to do, man. I'm here. What is to be will be, you know, I put in work. I'm going to have a good day. You're going to have a good day. Some days you're going to have challenges, but until you check all those boxes off and that comes with experience, I'll say that again, experience until you do it enough, all those things, those fears that you thought you had, they don't really exist. It's just all about experience. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I am just so excited. And I know Steve shares in this that, that a little bit of what we're talking about tonight goes an enormous way for you. You, because I've been doing this a long time and Steve has as well, athletes, I want you to know this works. <laughs> this is not just me pontificating and giving you good ideas. Mm -hmm. I've got data. I've got success story upon success story. Again, not that you're still not nervous, not that you're still not worried, not that you're still not a bit freaked out, but if you can begin to practice this, you will begin to feel freer. Um, again, in sport and out of sport. I just want to add a couple things and then don't worry everyone we're going to wrap up i just want to mention a couple things this is not the only thing yes there's working on your breathing and there's working on slowing down your breath there's visualization which we're not going to get into tonight there are plenty of other things i don't want you to think this is the only thing but to me this is the key and that's why i'm presenting on this tonight it starts to me with acceptance and allowing and having a plan to manage the doubts and knowing that it's part of the competitive race picture. If you're having doubts, it means you're leaning into life. It means you're on to something. And you know that feeling. Steve knows that feeling. I know that feeling. That's why you show up on race day. Um, and that's why you need to be prepared for it by doing the kind of training that you want. I like so, to say, Doc, that yes, um, go ahead. these mind my, my chatter, mind chatter doing an open water swim is a good first world problem to have. It's like, okay, is this, is, this, is this my biggest issue this week? Is this it? It's mind chatter for an open water swim? I'm going yes. to be all right. You know what I mean? There's a lot more that could be going on and is yes. going on for other people. Yes. Rather yes. than our own heads while we're yes. in the Yes, yes. And unfortunately, our minds can turn these things into, into um, right, catastrophic thoughts and catastrophic thinking, something that in its spirit is an, a chance for you to exercise your muscles and be in the community. Steve, you hopped on a little bit after, but we were talking about, we're of course partly here for the community. And the community is gonna help us all heal from everything going on in the world. And you're there and you keep coming back for more because it's the community. Whether you finish five, 10, 15 minutes faster or slower, nobody cares. Nobody cares. And you probably shouldn't care, maybe sometimes more than you do. Um, being grateful about the opportunity, I know it's something Steve talks about a lot, certainly is part of this picture here, especially with everything going on in the world. When you do get back to that race of Steve's or any race you do, if you're not grateful for that opportunity, knowing what it's like to not have it in your life, um, then you're probably kind of over-focusing on the things that could go wrong and the expectations and the other things. And I think maybe missing out on something that really, really is quite special. Um, so listen, um, I thank everybody who is able to show up to show up tonight as I thank you, Steve, and your whole staff for supporting this and helping me put it on. You, as you know, your staff is A+. Plus. Um, to Dan, my intern, my psych intern, uh, who's uh, been behind the scenes supporting me. And I'm available, guys. Um, you email me, check my website, my Instagram account for updates um, on things all related to sports psych. Um, uh, and by the way, it doesn't have to just be about triathlon. If I'm posting something about baseball, uh, you'll learn something that applies to triathlon. If I'm posting something about a completely different sport, it doesn't matter. It all applies. It all fits together because it all we're all the same. We all have a mind that looks for trouble despite our best interest. Uh, I do see there's one potential question. Um, oh, it's somebody just saying thank you very much. You're all very welcome. Thank you, everybody. Stay in touch, and I hope to see you on the boat. 
Uh, when is that, Steve? Sometime soon? <laughs> August 30th, God willing. <laughs> God willing, I will see you whether it's August 30th or some other day. I will see you sometime soon. God bless, stay safe, and stay in touch. Thank you.